This morning, our scripture is taken from the first chapter of the book of the prophet Isaiah. This is uh, from uh, a time in the life of Israel when they found themselves to be lacking. Well, maybe they didn't find themselves to be lacking, but God sure found them lacking. And God, through the prophet Isaiah, speaks a word first of judgment and a profound word of hope. And I think it's a word that needs to be heard in the world in which we live. Uh, reading verses 15 through 20 from this first chapter. When you stretch out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you, even though you make many prayers. I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rescue the oppressed. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widows. Come now. Let us argue this out, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be like snow. Though they're red like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you're willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Let us pray. O oh God, in this moment of silence, prepare our hearts to receive words of truth that you would speak through words very, very human. Now, O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts that every one of us think here today be found entirely acceptable in your sight, for you truly are our rock and our redeemer, our Savior and our Lord, today and forever. Amen. Do you get the feeling that Isaiah might not have been real pleased with Israel. He was speaking a word that wasn't his, but he was speaking a word that he understood God intended the people to hear. And you know, Isaiah had such a wonderful way with words. He could slice and dice from 40 paces and make it so clear you could not miss what he was saying, articulate, impassioned, eloquent in terms of using words that people understood and took to their heart. I've always appreciated people who could speak the truth and get to the point and make sure there was no misunderstanding. Now to be sure, Isaiah delivered a word that people could not fail to understand. God had a major bone to pick with them and Isaiah was going to make sure they understood that. He indicted them for their apostasy. You remember that God had entered into covenant with the people of Israel. They were to be the chosen. They were to be the ones who received the blessing, the providential goodness, the abundance of God. And the only condition was that they were to live as the people of God, reflecting the values of God, making things like justice and mercy, love and care the norm of their lives. It was really a promise 
that they had taken on themselves, and yet the prophet says, you've forgotten who you are as the people of God. You got dirty hands, they're bloody. Clean them. You look, and your sins are so profound, it's like they're scarlet because of your apostasy. And then he offers a word of hope. But if you will be faithful, God can take those bloody stains against the cloth of what God wants the world to be. And it could be washed and made white as wool. Now can't you see the contrast between the red blood of sin and the white cloth of purity? That's an image that none of us can miss. The difference between scarlet and white is so evident. It's like the difference between love and hate, war and peace, neglect and compassion. I think by this time, Isaiah would have had the attention of the people. And he was willing to say to them, your sin doesn't have to be the last word. There's one who can make your life what it's supposed to be, who can make this world what it's supposed to be. There's one capable of renewing the covenant. And all it takes is for you to decide to be faithful. I don't know about you, but sometimes I look around and I think, Where's the Isaiah in our day? This world's a broken place, isn't it? The division between people is so obvious. What is it that causes a people to be so turned inward that they think only of what will benefit me. Why isn't there a voice crying in the wilderness to remind people that we weren't put on this earth to build our own kingdom? We were put here to be the servants of one who says, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. You see, it's only in following Jesus that we or anyone else or the world can come to be all that God intends the creation to be. And we live in the presence of class divisions, the haves and the have-nots. The ins and the outs, the gays and the straights, the poor and the elite. Is that what God intended? Certainly not. Can you imagine Jesus walking the streets of Fort Worth or any other city on earth? are the most rural of communities. And observe what goes on today and not be heartbroken by it. And Jesus understands what Isaiah was talking about. And the truth is you do too. And I do too. And I confess today that I have had a part in letting the world turn from God's intention. 
I was baptized when I was nine years old. I was called to ministry when I was 16. I pastored my first church when I was 20. And I stand here a retired pastor today embarrassed because we have been unfaithful. Every person in this world is loved by God. Every person in this world is of inestimable value. Every person in this world, regardless of where they live, regardless of any circumstance, deserves to be treated with mercy and love and justice and deserves to be given hope because the God who created all that is and all of us and all the world's peoples is a God who will not give up the purpose for which he created it all. I failed to be what God's called me to be at times. And at my age, and I'll be 74 in July, I'm not thinking that I'll have all that long for God to use me for something better. But I pray that I'll be open to that. And I pray that people everywhere who call Jesus Savior and Lord will do a lot of soul searching because I think the jury's still out on whether we accept the invitation for renewal that God continues to extend us. There are people who need the gospel. And who's going to share it if we don't? I believe with all my heart that as we turn from an inward look to the outward look with which we were created. The world has a hope that nothing can extinguish. I I believe with all my heart that the best days of the church have not yet been. They can be ahead. They can be in front of us. In congregations like this one, know that you can be leaven in the loaf if all of us, every one of us, decide that we will follow Jesus and live like him that the world might know where hope is found. I think back at what's happened in our nation in recent years, and it tends to break my heart because we largely have lost the sense of being in this together. We've forgotten that It's for the whole of the good that we're here. God's a God who loves all people equally. Who desires mercy, justice, and hope to live in the heart of every human being. And most of all, those of us who call Jesus Savior and Lord are called to be those beacons of light in the world 
that others might know where justice, mercy, and love are found. This is Dr. Martin Luther King who said, there comes a time when silence is fair. What are we doing? Are we speaking up? I am a student of literature, and out of all the literary classics, there's one that I love particularly. It's the story of Don Quixote. Mitchell Lee wrote a song for that beautiful story. You remember Quixote, the self-appointed knight errant, who chose to ride around um, looking out of place. Uh, people looked at him and laughed, thought he was daft, demented, uh, crazy, because he dared to look at people through the eyes conditioned by mercy. Dulcinea, the part-time prostitute, part-time servant girl, became his lady in waiting, committed to serve her with nobility and faithfulness. Quixote jousted at windmills all his life because he had eyes conditioned by the hope found in the purpose of God. The song from Man of La Mancha, written by Mitch Lee, is called The Quest, and it was sung in the sanctuary a few weeks ago. You know it as the impossible dream. It's times like this, and that I, that I wished I could sing. I told my wife, Jane, I want to stand up there and sing that song, and she said, for God's sake, sir, please don't. And I won't, but I'll read the words. To dream the impossible dream, to fight the unbeatable foe, to bear with unbearable sorrow, to run where the brave dare not go, to right the unrightable wrong, to love, pure and chaste from afar. Just try with your arm when your arms are too weary to reach the unreachable star. This is my quest. To follow that star, no matter how hopeless, no matter how far, and to fight for the right without question or pause, to be willing to march into hell for a heavenly cause, and to know. If I'll always be true to this glorious quest that my soul shall lie peaceful and still when I'm laid to my rest. And the world will be better for this that one man scorned and covered with scars still strove with his last ounce of courage to reach the unreachable stars. I want to ask you a question. Can you picture Jesus on the cross singing that song? Or can you hear the words of the prophets looking over a world as broken as it can be? I can hear Isaiah I think singing that song. And my question is, will you? I might not be able to sing it, but I pray to God that I'm capable of living its truth. Of standing in a world so consumed by itself, 
that it doesn't care that the whole world is going to hell in a handbasket for things that don't matter. And God looks at us and says it doesn't have to be this way. God in Jesus Christ is going to keep on singing. And I pray that you will too. As bad as my voice is, I'm going to keep on singing. And I pray that together the chorus of mercy and justice and peace will be the only chorus that the world hears. May it be so in the name of God, creator, savior, and spirit of hope, now and forever. Amen.